glad that you are here worshiping with us. If we haven't met, my name is Pastor Christina Turner. I'm one of the pastors here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. And along with Annie Oak, which is Annie Jewell, David Cannon, and Justin Lacey, we lead this evening worship experience every week at 6 p.m. We started just a couple, uh, maybe about a year and a half ago, a few months ago, we had tried to start uh, a new worship experience, and then Hurricane Florence happened, and we found that we just wanted a place to come to kind of bring our whole selves um, to seek connection and not perfection, to come just as we are, to worship the God who meets us just where we are. And so we are so glad that you are here with us, whether you are out on your patio, whether you're out in a yard um, practicing good social distancing, whether you are in your living room in your PJs. We are so glad that you are here with us, and we hope that you will say hi, introduce yourself in the comments, and say where you're watching from, and feel free to interact with your fellow worshipers this evening. This is our third week of online worship, and it seems strange as we continue the season of Lent, but maybe it's appropriate that we feel like we are walking in the wilderness. And so I invite you to, um, if you would like, if you have one there, to light a candle. Um, to, to set the stage uh, for an experience with God. We'd like to thank you all um, so much for your generosity this past week. Um, we usually don't take up an offering at Sundays at 6, but we would love to invite you. Uh, our band will be playing an offertory later on in, in the service, and so we'd love to invite you to maybe click over either on the Wrightsville app or to the website, rightsvilleumc.org, and to give financially. Our church building is closed, but we want to keep doing our mission and ministry. We want to keep offering worship experiences, to keep having Sunday school classes and youth group, to keep, um, keep compensating our awesome musicians. And so we um, need your help to do that. Uh, we also encourage you this week to, um, if you have a little extra and feel able to, to give to Family Promise, which is an organization also called Interfaith that helps provide care to, uh, to families who are experiencing homelessness. They are in exceptional need right now. And so we would invite you to go to the Wrightsville page. Um, in, the, in the memo line, you can mark Family Promise, or you can see the link that will be posted in this video later. We also want to thank you for your generosity in participating in our 412 Youth Virtual Spaghetti Dinner. They were able, through all of our spaghetti selfies that we posted, to raise close to $1,600 for our youth mission trips. And so we are so glad for that. Um, but friends, we are, regardless of who you are, whether you have been in this space or not, or especially if it's your first time worshiping with us, we are so glad you're here. And now I invite you to pray with me. Oh God, we are in the wilderness. For some of us, life feels noisy. For some of us, life feels too loud and overwhelming. God, none of us know what tomorrow is going to hold. Lord, we may be peaceful, we may be anxious, we may be scared, we may have made our peace with this new normal. We may, like your servant Ezekiel, feel like we are walking around in a valley of dry bones. No matter where we are, God, welcome us into your presence. Invite us here and help us to rest in you so that when we leave this time and this space, we will be different. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
watching, snuggled up on the couch. We, you are not watching. I keep saying watching, but you are worshiping with us. And we are so glad that you are here with us in spirit, if not in person. And we can't wait to see you soon. Our scripture for today, we keep walking through our series called Ask Me Another, talking about questions, uh, questions for God. But today's scripture is not a question for God, but a question from God. Just to set the stage, this is a scripture from the book of Ezekiel, which I don't spend a lot of time in, to be honest. I'm not sure if you do. I Ezekiel is one of these strange books that is filled with all kinds of apocalyptic visions, all sorts of strange, strange seeings. And this is one of the most beloved stories and the weirdest stories from the book of Ezekiel. It comes from Ezekiel chapter 37, and um, it's called the Valley of Dry Bones, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 14. I'm reading it out of the Bibles that are in the pews, and which is the New Revised Standard Version. And I invite you to join me if you would like, and maybe even to close your eyes and to let this scene wash over you, to imagine that you are Ezekiel, that you are a prophet, and that you have been taken, transported, to this strange new reality. I invite you to think about what do you see? What do you hear? What do you feel? What do you touch? Maybe even what do you taste? Hear this word. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, Prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act says the Lord. Would you pray with me? O oh God, of our gardens and God of our valleys of dry bones, God of our celebrations and God of our tears, God of our gratitude and God of our laments, we would ask you to be with us today, but we know that you are always here. And so we're asking that you show us where you are, that you would help us to feel you and see you, that we would see life come to dead places. And Lord, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I had a friend who, in the most Appalachian of ways, went to a church harvest party. 
Harvest parties are what they call them in West Virginia when they don't want to say Halloween party because Halloween might feel like you're a heathen and you don't want to be a heathen. You want to be a good Christian. And so they were having a harvest party, even though that sounds very weird and possibly weirder than Halloween, which Halloween comes from All Hallows' Eve, which is a Christian holiday, but whatever. They said, we need you to not dress in any scary costumes, not any gory costumes, not any costumes that would scare the, the toddlers. We want you to dress in a Bible costume. And there everyone came. They were dressed up in their best bath robes as a shepherd or the Virgin Mary who was wearing a blue bath towel, always a blue bath towel over her head. Um, but then they did not plan for a strange thing which was this, that some of these kids might have actually read the parts in the Bible that seemed a little bit weird, <laughs> that seemed a little bit wonky. And they did not have in mind that someone would have read the book of Ezekiel and would come to the church harvest party dressed up as a skeleton. They said, we told you there are no scary costumes allowed. This is a Bible party. And then um, this lovely young woman said, Oh, uh, but I will show you where it is in the Bible. And she pulled out the book of Ezekiel, turned to chapter 37, and said, I am a skeleton that has come back to life, but does not yet have flesh and sinews upon me. And I'm not quite sure what they did at this lovely church, but I, I, bet, that that, I, I bet that they have never forgotten that. Because this is a weird story. It's a wonky story. It's a little bit off-kilter, a little bit off-kilter story. And thanks to Annie for making, our, making our, uh, our camera a little bit less wonky. Folks, I said it's connection and not perfection, and we are living it out with you. Can you imagine being Ezekiel, being a prophet? A prophet, as I learned in seminary, is, is, is a word for a weirdo. A holy weirdo, a weirdo that God speaks to, somebody that if you saw on the street, you would probably go to the other side of the street and say that person has some sort of severe problem. And Ezekiel, like all of the prophets, was asked to do weird things and to say weird things that would make people hate him or at least scratch their heads or walk to the other side of the street. The context for all of this, for this weird, spooky story that seems to go more with Halloween than with Lent and Easter, the context is that Ezekiel is preaching to a people who feel like they are in a time that is, to quote a word that I have used a lot recently, unprecedented. Ezekiel, he was one of the members of God's people, God's family. The people that God had chosen out of all the people of the earth to be God's anointed, God's possession, God's holy ones. They had a temple, a place where they came, where they all gathered, where they went up to to worship God. They had lands and families and vineyards and, you know, um, unleavened bread factories, all of these places. They had the place where you could go and get your lamb chops from the kosher butcher you had the place where you would take your child to the river to help draw water or to wash your clothes. But the prophets had been telling the people, they had been saying, watch out, you need to, to turn back to God. And so Ezekiel writes to a people who is, has been exiled. A people that are practicing a lot of social distancing, who are not safe at home, but away from each other. It says the four winds, north, south, east, and west, there they are, captive by, these, by the Babylonian Empire, taken away. Some scholars think eight to 10,000 other people beside Ezekiel had gone into exile in this strange new normal. They didn't take the peasants, they took the rich, they took the leaders, they took the scholars, they took people who were professional class. And the folks that were left behind were left behind in a place where the temple had been destroyed. The only place they thought that they could feel God's presence wasn't there. Where was God? Maybe they didn't even know. 
And the book of Ezekiel has one of the saddest things, and it has this vision in which Ezekiel talks about um, the glory of God, the physical presence of God leaving the temple and going somewhere else. I'm relating pretty hard to this this week um, as we once again um, tape a worship, uh, record a worship, Facebook Live a worship um, without you here, <laughs> with you on the other side of my weird little tripod thing that all that is just a tiny bit askew and that feels like some sort of prophetic sign act, maybe. Maybe I'm the holy weirdo as well. But it's a time that we don't know when we are going to be at the end of. A time with more questions than answers. A time where we're like, where is God? And in all of this, the lectionary, the, uh, the three-year cycle of reading, sticks us with this. This strange Halloween story. This strange Easter story. And says, here you go. And plops us down right here in the Valley of the Dry Bones. I saw a picture this week that I haven't been able to get out of my mind. It's a picture of a church in Italy. Maybe some of y'all have seen it. It's a church, uh, a place of worship where people were gathered, and in it is coffins. <laughs> I never could picture the Valley of the Dry Bones before. I always just think of beautiful Oakdale Cemetery, which has become a running joke uh, between me and Annie's dad, Kelly Jewell, of when have I been, have I been to Oakdale Cemetery yet? It's beautiful this time of year. I'm sorry, Kelly. I don't think I can do Oakdale, at least until all this is over. But I, you know, think of cemeteries as nice, you know, as a place of, you know, a, a place of grieving. Not nice, but at least, you know, manicured, clipped, trimmed. That wasn't the valley that Ezekiel was in. He wasn't in a memorial gardens. He wasn't in a place with a nice little angel statue and some, you know, some roses put on your loved one's headstone. He was in a valley full of bones. And I pictured that Italian church with all of these coffins sitting in there. I imagined being in that place. It still gives me chills, to be honest. God taking us to that place and asking us, can these dry bones live? It's a weird question because the answer, of course, is no. No, God, these bones cannot live. Do you understand how life works? Do you understand how bones work? Do you understand how things work? People do not come back to life, God. This is one of the rules of rules. And yet, Ezekiel doesn't say what you think he would say, which is either, heck no, God, these bones can't live, or he doesn't say, oh yes, oh Lord, I believe. I trust you with every fiber of my being. I just know that I will see all of these bones come back to life. The Bible always, um, it, in, in these stories about death, it doesn't pull its punches. When it talks in John about Lazarus coming back to life, it said that there was an odor. It said in the King James Version, he stinketh, Lord. <laughs> and he stinketh. He had been in the tomb for a while. The scripture, it's never somebody that has just died. It's never a situation that might be within redeeming if you just, you know, squinted a little bit. It's always something that is really, really hopeless, that feels really, really out of control, really, really dire. And that's when God steps in. In the scripture, it says, um, in and they were lying in the valley. In verse 2, it says, there were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. The idea is, this is not just kind of magic trick of some bones that are probably fine. These have been there for a while. They represent, to Ezekiel and to God and to us, the people of Israel, God's people, who it seemed like God had abandoned. And it's into that space that God asks mortal in another word, son of man, human one, can these bones live? And Ezekiel, God bless him, answers, O oh Lord God, you know. O oh Lord God, you know. It's one of these questions, uh, not a question for God, but a question from God. Can this live? Can this economy live? <laughs> can this bank account that is growing smaller by the day live? Can this... Marriage, this relationship, survive?
can these churches that are filled with empty pews somehow come back better than ever? Can this church who um, doesn't know how to reach out to its community, thankfully I don't believe it's our church, but there are many churches, can this church that is stuck in its ways, can these people who um, don't realize what they have, can all of this, can all of these dead situations, can they live? I wonder. I wonder what, for you, is the valley of dry bones that you're surrounded with. I wonder if it's purpose that feels like it's died. I wonder if it is loneliness that feels like if you are here for one more minute, you are going to dress a cat up in like a surgical gown and mask and like make it be a healthcare worker. I wonder if you feel so dry that you are the bones that you need God to breathe life into. What are your dry bones? Christians have a weird relationship with graveyards. Maybe I should go to Oakdale. Maybe I'm going to go to Oakdale before all of this is over. Because in graveyards, <laughs> we see that God does things that don't make sense. I have heard from some friends who aren't Christian that say, you know, I could believe this if it wasn't for the whole dead person coming to life thing. And I think that that's a fairly reasonable objection. <laughs> I've also seen things that have been very dead, that have been very dry, that have come back to life. And I think that some of those are more of a miracle than bones reassembling and gathering breath, than Jesus coming back to life. The early Christians sometimes used to meet um, in their houses like we are now. They didn't have the benefit of technology. They would just sit around, they would pray, they would sing, they would play whatever the, you know, first century equivalent of the banjo is, and they would praise God. But sometimes they would gather where people couldn't find them, in places like the catacombs, those strange valleys of dry bones, and there they would say, this is not the end, God is here. God is here. And I love that um, Ezekiel in this story does not see Israel come back from the exile. He just sees a sign of hope. Uh, but the thing is that God does not snap God's hands and just fix it all. God brings Ezekiel alongside. God has a conversation with Ezekiel. He says, can these bones live? And Ezekiel says, oh Lord God, you know. And then he gives Ezekiel a job to do. He asks Ezekiel to be the answer to his prayers, as God many times asks us to be the answer to our prayers, even as we pray. It's one of those weird things that we say, where is God? What is God doing? It's the easiest answer, one that I've heard that some pastors, um, including one my friend this week heard of or proclaiming, that this is God's judgment on this, that, or the other. It would be nice if the world worked that way, if we could see a one-to-one -one relationship between when people are bad and when bad things happen to them. But this is not the God that we serve. And I love in the scripture that uh, they said, oh, you will know that I am the Lord, not when you are destroyed, not when you have this great act of judgment. D did you see it in here? In, in verse 6, I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. Not when they are destroyed. You will know that God is here, that God is working when you come back to life. When all of those dry bones assemble, when there is breath in them again, and when there is a whole new possibility where there wasn't one before. The word for breath in the Hebrew is ruach, which sounds like you're coughing. Um, don't say ruach out in the CBS or you're going to get kicked out. Um, the word means spirit or wind or breath. Back then, the ancient Hebrews thought that it was the same, that the spirit that was breathing new life is the same as the breath that's in our lungs. I've never thought about breath more than the past couple weeks thought about ventilators and respirators and whether or not I'm short of breath or whether or not I just don't do CrossFit and so I'm just out of breath when I climb three flights of stairs. But the breath of God in our lungs is there so that we, like Ezekiel, can be God's co-workers in mending the
this broken world. It's God tells us, I want you to pray. I don't know why. I don't know why God doesn't just fix it. But for some reason, somehow, God wants not only to redeem the world, to make the dry bones live, but to use us. And so maybe today, um, or tomorrow, or this week, or Monday at 5, when you've suddenly got a lot of time on your hands because you are now safe at home, um, maybe think about that. Listen to the wind in the trees. Put your hand on your chest and feel your breath that is so life-giving and so essential. And remember that the same spirit that hovered under the waters, the same breath that God breathed into those bones, that same resurrection power is living in you and all of us. People keep saying everything's going to be fine and everything's going to be okay. I don't know what fine means. I don't know what okay means. It's not okay for those folks that we're in the church in Italy. I do know this, that God does not cause pain, but that God can redeem it, that God is always breathing life into dead situations, that there is something, something, something that is beautiful that will come from this. I have to believe it. <laughs> I have to believe it even when on day one of the quarantine I say, I'm going to take this as a chance to improve my health. And on day two of the quarantine I say, for personal reasons, I will be eating a whole lasagna in the shower today. I have to believe it because I know that God is a God of mercy. That I know that God is a God of resurrection. And maybe this year I can't wait two weeks for Easter. I need a little Easter now. And so friends, I invite you in the comments as our band plays to reflect. Where are the dry bones that you see? Where is the life that you are seeing? Where do you want God to breathe life into you? Breath. It's the first thing that entered our lungs in the beginning. Um, it's something we worry about when we don't brush our teeth, except not now because the only people that are allowed to be close enough to us are the people that don't mind if we have bad breath. Breath. It's what God breathes into us and what brings us into eternal life. Where do you need the breath of God to breathe into our world? What signs of new life do you see?
so much, Annie Oak. Breathe on me, breath of God. We kind of, we're going to be singing that in a little bit. And it's one of those things where every hymn feels a little strange now. Whether, when you sing, give me clean hands, it feels weird. When you sing, breathe on me. When you sing, I come to the garden alone. It's like, good, you should be alone. <laughs> Don't go to Palm Tree Island. Um, but I wonder how this space where we are right now, this strange, in-between, unprecedented time, can help us to read scripture in a way that we didn't before. What sort of stories do we understand now that we didn't before or understand in a different way? How can we depend on God in a way that we haven't before? I find myself doing that. I get up and I say, God, I don't know. Give me what I need to do this day. Give me the strength. Give me the technological prowess. Give me the words. Give me the whatever. Give me the breath. I was thinking about a time in which I was um, serving abroad. I taught abroad in China, not close to Wuhan, but not that far away either. I mean, China's a big country. But um, I was there in 2005 and 2006, and while I was there, I heard, um, I heard a story. I would go to the Christian church in town, um, in the town that I lived in called Jianya, which means rivers of oil. <laughs> it was a natural gas distilling place, and it had these huge smokestacks that like spewed stuff into the sky so that you could never see the sun except for maybe one day a month. I wonder what the sky looks like there now. But I went to the Christian church. It was a church that had been built um, almost 100 years ago. There had been a Methodist missionary that had gone there, and it felt very much like a Methodist church. They were robes and stoles. They had Chinese pastors and all sorts of folks there. There was no heat. There was no AC. And so the, the grandmas and the aunts, because there were a lot of grandmas and aunts, often who couldn't read and were learning to read through literacy classes at the church, would bundle up. One of them one day told me about the church, um, this old church made of wood and brick, um, when it had been built and when during the Cultural Revolution it had been shuttered. There were windows that had had rocks thrown through them. Those um, folks who were Christians buried their Bibles sometimes, um, not because they were ashamed of them, but because they wanted to keep them safe for when they would be back in the future, because they believed that they would be back. They went to the north and the south and the east and the west, and then um, the, the most crazy thing happened in that somehow they were able to come and to worship again. They told me these stories, and it still gives me chills when I think about it, that dear auntie from the church who, um, who was a Christian and took her bike um, to the bus and the bus to the street where they still gathered um, all those years later in the place that that man had started and the place that now they sang Chinese songs of praise to God. She said, I remember coming back into the church, opening it up the first Sunday we were back after we were able to be there. She says there were dirt and there were rats and there were cobwebs and there was broken glass everywhere from when they had thrown it all over. Um, the, the windows had been broken. And she said, and then we swept up the glass. Then we wiped up the cobwebs. Then we brought it back to life again. Friends, know that in the valley of the dry bones, that God is with you, just waiting to breathe new life. Amen. Annie Oak is going to play for us. Are we doing prayer first or are we doing play in first? <laughs> Let's go ahead and pray. I invite you all to, um, to, to type in the comments any sort of prayers that you would like to lift out to God. And I invite you to share with your, with your brothers and sisters, with your siblings in the comments. Um, I invite you as you read these, maybe to through a life or a heart or to a message to this person, um, to add your prayers to theirs by saying, Lord, hear our prayer. And now I invite you to pray with me. Oh God, who is nearer than our very breath, Lord, we are tired. We are weak. We are born. We are worn. <laughs> we need you, and we don't even know what to ask for. 
And so, God, we pray that you would hold us close, that you would breathe into us the breath of life again, that you would bring an end to this pandemic, that you would work through all of the folks, through the doctors and nurses, the respiratory therapists and custodians, the truck drivers and farmers, the cleaning crews, the supermarket checkers, that you would work through us. God, show us what is our work to do for today. And help us, like Ezekiel, to be in conversation with you. You, O oh Lord, know. Bring us, breathe into us new life this day. We pray, as your son Jesus taught us to pray, and we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, as any Oak plays, I invite you to maybe click over um, to, to give if, if you are able and as you are able. If you're not able to give financially right now, then I just invite you maybe to write down or to ask God, what is some way that you can give um, in a way other than finances? And then we'll come back and we'll sing together that song they played, Breathe on Me, Breath of God.
Amen. I can tell y'all were singing beautifully. I, I just, I just know it. I just know it. <laughs> I was thinking about how just a few weeks ago we were gathered here. A couple of weeks ago, I also said it felt like it was about January 75th, and now I'd like to apologize to the month of January because January just feels like nothing. But just a few weeks ago, we were here gathered in the sanctuary for Ash Wednesday, and. We gather to remember that dust we are and to dust we shall return. That God uses those of us who feel like dry bones to breathe new life into this world. Maybe from six feet away and farther if you're sick. So I'd like to conclude today with a blessing. This is a blessing written by Reverend Jan Richardson, an artist and poet and Methodist pastor from Florida. It's called Blessing the Dust, and it's usually an Ash Wednesday blessing, but maybe, just maybe, we are all feeling a little bit ashy today. And so I invite you to hear this blessing, which we'll post later in the comments. All those days you felt like dust, like dirt, as if all you had to do was turn your face toward the wind and be scattered to the four corners or swept away by the smallest breath as insubstantial? Did you not know what the Holy One can do with dust? This is the day we freely say we are scorched. This is the hour we are marked by what has made it through the burning. This is the moment we ask for the blessing that lives within the ancient ashes, that makes its home inside the soil of this sacred earth. So let us not be marked, so let us be marked but not for sorrow, and let us be marked, but not for shame. Let us be marked, not for false humility or for thinking we are less than what we are, but for claiming what God can do within the dust, within the dirt, within the stuff of which the world is made, and the stars that blaze in our bones, and the galaxies that spiral inside the smudge we bear. Friends, God can do a lot with dust, with dirt, with dry bones, with you. So go out and be good news. Take good care of yourself. Wash your hands. And we'll see you next Sunday at 6.